So um, thank you everyone for coming out on this stormy night. And I would also like to acknowledge the uh, ancient homeland of the Salish people and say haichka to the, the people here. Um, I've been at UBC since July 1st, so I'm a very new faculty. And uh, Link was uh, on the hiring committee. So from one Lakota to another, it's great to be working with you. And so when he invited me to uh, 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 select a couple of artists to talk about uh, what's going on in Aboriginal art, I immediately thought of these two. <laughs> and the reason why is uh, because our practices combined, I think, are, 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 are diverse, as well as there's a lot of common ground. And um, so I'm, I, I think we'll see the connections as the work flows together. Um, here sits Sean Hunt. Hi, Sean. And Sean is uh, an artist. He's also a graduate from UBC. Yep. And he's a, uh, an artist, a, a painter, a carver, and works with, uh, uh, within the tradition of Northwest Coast uh, design elements uh, from the, I hope I'm saying it right, Helsic, yeah. uh, Helsic community up in Bella Coola. Bella Bella. Bella, Bella. And um, what I find so interesting about Sean's work is, you know, he's using these ancient forms and, and, and bringing them into a whole new realm of contemporary uh, arts production. So we'll see some of his work um, and he, you know, from painting and sculpture as well as some silver work. And over here is Laurie Blondeau from Saskatoon. Um, she's a PhD candidate in the School of Interdis Interdisciplinary Studies. Interdisciplinary Studies at the University of Saskatoon. Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, sorry. And Lori is a performance artist <coughs> as well as a curator. And she runs an uh, artist run center in Saskatoon called Tribe, which uh, does multiple events and multi site events. And what is interesting about Tribe as an artist run center is that they don't have a space of their their own, but she co-partners with many institutions in Saskatchewan and puts on exhibitions and performance events and uh, publications and that kind of thing. So aside from being a student and a curator and running a cultural organization, she's also a mother and, um, and an artist. And so she works also with uh, photography and performance art. So we're going to begin tonight with Sean's presentation, and then we'll go to Lori and then to mine, and then I thought after that we could have a discussion with everybody. Sound good? Oh, it sounds like I'm yelling. Thank you. Okay. So thank you all for coming. Okay, take it away. <coughs> Sean's going to steer the ship now, right. or the canoe. You guys can hear me? Yeah? Okay. Thanks for coming out, by the way. It's, uh, really ugly outside. I probably wouldn't have left the house if I didn't have to do this, or want to do this. Okay. Should I begin now? Yeah. All right. Um, I, like Dana said, I, uh, I graduated from UBC Fine Arts. Um, I also went to Capilano College and did the studio program there. Um, and then was fortunate enough to have a father that is a native artist. And so when I finished art school, I walked right into a fully equipped studio. Um, I, I guess I've been making art my entire life, though, really. It began, I mean, earlier than I can remember, I started trying to, I'm really competitive, so I tried to be better than my dad. Um, and uh, I still try. Um, I, so when I finished uh, school, as most artists, when they finish school, they go 
why did I do that? What am I going to do with it? And uh, so I was kind of hanging out around home and helping my dad on some of his stuff. And he suggested that I take up uh, the carving of jewelry. And so I gave it a try and started carving copper bracelets. And I think I made it about two weeks, a week, maybe a week or two, and said I was never going to do it again because I couldn't do it. I, uh, what I saw in my head, I did not see on the metal. And uh, it was really frustrating. So he told me to, you know, stick with it. Give it like, I think he said give it a month. And I gave it a month. And then I got so wrapped up in it that I did it for probably like four years straight every day. Like all day, all night. It's all I did. Um, which was good because it, it uh, bracelets and doing jewelry and that kind of thing is, it's kind of an immediate way to make something. It's, uh, I have to design something and then it's like, a week or two fabrication, and then design again. So you become very good at designing because you're constantly designing. Um, so I started out uh, making uh, silver bracelets, uh, eagles, ravens, uh, traditional iconography. Um, and then I got, at some point, bored of it. Um, I got bored of people coming to me and commissioning pieces and saying, well, you know, I'm the raven. I need a raven bracelet. Um, or coming to me and saying, you know, what animal am I? And I would say, I have no idea. I just met you. <laughs> but <coughs> um, I got tired of that. And I, I actually one day uh, made a bracelet that was a human. I made a human bracelet. And I brought it to a dealer uh, who will remain nameless. And he said, there's no way he could sell it. He was like, nobody buys humans, you know? <laughs> and so I was like, instantly, that was just, for me, that was like, OK, well, from here on out, I'm doing humans. Like, and so um, it also was a bit of a, I was, uh, I was, I was wondering why humans weren't in the artwork. You know, it's, it's, it's very easy. It, it kind of reminded me of like Emily Carr and the Group of Seven and, and how they, they didn't include humans in their work. It was like this dying culture, this barren landscape. And I, it got me thinking like, you know, we, people will easily buy an eagle bracelet, but they won't buy a human bracelet. So why is that? And I started thinking about that. And so I started putting humans into my bracelets. And then once I started putting humans in my bracelets, I started thinking about each thing as a character. And you know, it was like, at that time, native art was kind of trending towards uh, minimalism. And people were doing a lot of bracelets and things like that that were getting more and more abstract that were, and I was thinking like, you know, it, there's so much richness here in like, uh, we, I could take these creatures and I could be making them have conversations. They could, you know, have a personality. There could be humor. And so I started, you know, down the road of making bracelets that had something to say, which is the way I had to go anyways because that's kind of the way I've always made artwork. And the, the first piece I'm going to start off with, I'm going to start off with the jewelry that I, I did. And I'm, uh, the first one I have here is called, uh, let's see here, these are in the same order. Um, I was asked by uh, a dealer to commission a piece, and I had done I had done a bracelet called Berry Picker, and it was a woman picking berries, and people went off on it for some reason. I don't know why. It was just one of those ones that works, and everybody after that wanted a berry picker, and I just won't do the same thing twice. It's just it bores me. I, you know, it just I can't do it, and so. For the next year, people kept ordering berry pickers. And it was like, man, I just can't do this. So I kept figuring out ways around it. And uh, I think this piece, I went and I, uh, I'll put it up. The client, yeah, you can kind of see it. OK. The client uh, was getting very involved and you know, wanted a certain thing. And uh, so I really didn't want to give it to him. You know, it was, uh, I wanted to do my own thing. And I was battling it out with the, uh, the dealer. And so I created this piece where it was Raven 
flying with a talking stick in his mouth, and it was called, now I can say whatever I want, because he's stolen the talking stick, right? And so he has the power to speak. And uh, they loved it. Yeah, I don't know if they understood fully what I was talking about, but I, I tend not to, this is actually one of the first times that I've uh, really talked about my work. Can you guys see that very well? Um, so you can, you can see the bracelet, there's a wing, and then there's Raven in the middle with the talking stick going through his beak, and it was kind of done in miniature, and there's a frog on the other side. And uh, so that was a way for me to satisfy myself, and I got to make what I wanted, and uh, they liked it. And so that got me thinking, like, maybe I should just do what I want to do, and regardless of you know, whether it's a commission or not. And so I've kind of been doing that from that point on. I, uh, if I like what the person's saying when they commission something, then maybe I'll agree to do it. And if they don't, then I'll do something completely different that I think they'll like, and so far they have. Um, after that, I, uh, let me take you to a different piece of jewelry here. Um, so this is a piece I did called Matter of Perspective. And uh, starting from one edge here, uh, there's a hand uh, enlarged uh, showing perspective. Uh, and in that hand it are raven, frog, and eagle, and a canoe. And as you move across, there's a human with uh, various kind of little spirits and elements in it. And then as you continue across, the hair and finally on the back, an eyeball. So in this piece, I was playing with the idea of perspective, which generally in Northwest Coast design, you're not dealing with perspective. You're dealing with flatness. Um, and so I wanted to exaggerate the perspective by having the hand come forward, the creatures appearing very large, and the, and the face, you know, the same size as the face. So I'm playing with perspective there. And then there's the perspective of you know, the human looking at the creatures, there's the creatures looking at the human, and then also there's the perspective of you, uh, the admirer, gazing at the bracelet, as well as the bracelet on the very back gazing at you constantly with this eye on the back. So just taking that whole idea of perspective and the gaze and then kind of, I guess, exploiting it. Um, Let me see here if I've brought another. Uh, again, here's a, uh, this is a bracelet I did called uh, I'm Selling My Ovoids. And I did this one for uh, an auction. And um, so I, I got to thinking, you know, like, the native art has become so sought after and it's so incredibly expensive. Uh, I thought, you know, if Raven had the ability he would probably remove his ovoid from his body and sell his own ovoid, knowing how much it's worth, right? And him being kind of a trickster. Um, so in this piece, starting from this side, I have the two people bidding on the, uh, the piece, and they are represented in coppers to show wealth. So there's a male and female figure. And uh, they kind of almost represent the, you know, the auction card too, right? You're holding up. And as you move across the bracelet, you can see Raven holding the ovoid down at the bottom in his beak. And there, that's kind of a better shot of it. Um, and then on his shoulder, where the ovoid would be, design-wise, it's been removed. And actually, the little bone in your arm sticks through it. So you actually be kind, of be, you kind of become part of the bracelet, because this bone actually sticks out higher than the bracelet. Uh, let's get another shot here. And then, of course, the frog on the other side. And I'll show you one more bracelet just to kind of show you. I don't do a lot of bracelets anymore, but this one I actually did about, I think I did it about eight months ago. And uh, kind of shows the evolution. 
So I use the technique of uh, oxidizing. So that I, I, I saw this technique and I saw Bill Reed's use of it and uh, realized quite early that I could make, a, make it very graphic. You know, I could use two colors instead of one. That's why I tended, that's basically the only reason why I make silver jewelry instead of gold is that I can, I can get a real graphic look to using the silver. Uh, gold's nice, it's worth a lot and uh, it's real pretty, but I can't do that. So you can see it there, too. Uh, very uh, kind of a graffiti style of frog. And uh, I actually love this design so much that I actually carved it later on, and I'll show you it to, in, in the carved form, too. Took me a while uh, to get that one down. Um, and then from my jewelry, I... Uh, I managed to uh, talk my way into doing a incredible house project. And not too many people have seen it um, because it's a private residence, but um, I, my brother and myself and my father all worked on this house for four years. Um, and I was lead carver, I suppose, because I designed it and we carved in my style, but uh, the three of us worked together on it, so obviously there was you know, a lot of ad lib and you know, a lot of discussion between us as we looked for the best way to do things. I'm gonna show you the, the, uh, the entrance way. So that's the entrance way there. Um, several things going on here. Uh, when I ha had the idea of doing house posts, of course, I, I just, I always want to make things that I haven't seen before. Like, I'm my biggest fan. You know, like, I want to create something, and I'm always in love with what I'm, whatever I'm making because it's the first time I've ever seen it. And so with these poles, it's a little hard to tell here, but what I wanted to do, do was a lot of totem poles are cut away at the back, and so you have the first, you have the kind of a two-thirds, and, and the design's wrapped around it. So I really wanted to get sculptural, so definitely the idea was to do it so that they were creatures sitting on top of one another, so the house post was the format. Um, and then also I was looking at uh, most totem poles, especially at this time, the ones that I'd seen were all symmetrical. So it was forward facing, you could cut it down the middle and it was basically the same design on each side. And so what I wanted to do was use two lines of symmetry. Um, and so each of the each of the creatures on the top of each post face directly forward, and on all the bottom ones toe inward, the back two toe in, and then the front two toe in. So that was really, you know, we were all really excited about that at the beginning, and then it got really difficult. Oh. Sweet. Okay. Uh, it was, you know, it was, it was a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. Um, and hence the reason why it took about seven and a half months to carve each pole. Um, they rise out of the water, which is, I thought was a pretty cool feature. Uh, that's just the detail from the back of it to show you, you know, that they're fully carved. Every aspect of these was, you know, labored over. And, and so we, you know, we figured we're going to carve every single part of these things so that they have something unique within them. You can see uh, the, the structure of them is, is that the base of them is water creatures, and then above them is uh, the creatures of the air, and then on the back two poles are land with humans wearing masks. Um, just, uh, I brought this piece in because it, this was one of the most complex sections. I had to do add-ons. Uh, you can see it there and there. Um, it's the mother bear with three cubs, and then on the opposite side is uh, the wolf with three pups. The owner has six children, and I wanted to honor that within the piece. Um, here's an example of one of the human creatures, and so he's wearing the mask of a raven, but you can see at the back the hair with the strap holding the mask on and wearing a chill cat with the hand coming through here, uh, his foot kind of turning into the claw. So he's in a state of transformation with the, uh, one of the wolf uh, uh, pups between his legs. And that's the other side, the eagle, with 
uh, a frog in his lap. And again, you can see that he's wearing a mask. And that's kind of from the front there. And there's the moon with uh, hair coming down on each side and two frogs in the hair. And then a male and, oh, male and female fi uh, human face represent the, the man and the woman on uh, each side. Now, for this same client, I uh, also did a uh, fireplace. So that's the outside of the house, and this sits on the inside. And what I was uh, looking at here was, there's a myth, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it or not, but of how Raven steals the sun from the wealthy chief's storage chest. Uh, and I thought, you know, what a great opportunity to do that, you know. And, and one thing that kind of always kind of struck me was that, you know, the sun was inside a box and the box was made out of wood and fire consumes wood, so how is that, how can that be, right? So the idea was, uh, I was jacked up on coffee one morning and they had a problem with the fireplace that they were going to put in. It was going to be dangerous. And so I suggested doing this and they went for it. And so you have the box with the myth depicted around it. Uh, so you can pick it up at any point, and you, it basically tells you the myth around it. And then the sun is represented by the fire inside. This is carved out of red cedar, so uh, there was, you know, there's definitely some engineering so that it doesn't burn up. Whoa. And uh, then the lid is made of steel, so it's the bentwood box with the lid pulled off and uh, with bronze watchman figures on the top. Uh, so here's a more of a traditional bentwood chest. And I incorporated a traditional bentwood chest into the box, as you can see right here, where Raven is taking the sun from the bentwood box that wraps right around the corner. Um, and then, uh, you know, I wanted to include my jewelry kind of practice in there too. So yeah, that's, you know, her earring, the princess's earring. And... bracelet. So that's just carved in wood and then painted silver. And just another view here. You can see the style. It's relief carved. I think it started out about three inches thick. It's not a bent wood box because of the size and the thickness. It was just impossible to bend. So it's actually mitered and made to look like it's bent. That's a close up of the uh, bronze watchman figure. Can, for those of you that know your art, that's a Lawrence Paul in the background. So that project took up, you know, a large portion of my life, but I learned a lot and it was cool. And I was, you know, I got to work with my family and, uh, you know, really, really sculpt. And at the same time as I was working on that, I... Uh, because that just wasn't enough for me. I started painting for the first time. I never painted before in my life. And so I took up painting. And this wasn't my first painting, but I think it was my third. This was my third painting. And I don't know if any of you have seen it before, but it uh, is called The Trickster. And uh, I did it for a show for the Bill Reed Gallery. and. Uh, it was an idea that I had had for a while, and uh, I get these ideas, and it, it, sometimes it takes me a while to flush them out. Sometimes it happens very fast. This, this painting took me, I think, I, I mean, I was working on the house project at the same time, but it probably took me about six months to draw this, to get it how I wanted it. Um, most people, you know, take it for face, face value as what it is, but I was particularly proud of this piece for this section right here. That took, the, that took me so long to figure out. And I basically took the wing that Bill Reed designed, and I took the traditional salmon trout head uh, done in an ovoid and punched it out. And you can see here I've taken you know, a, a U-form and pulled it so that it becomes a nose. And then uh, under the wing, he had a, a split U, which is basically a U-shape that's split down the middle. And I took that and then punched that out into an arm that actually grips on. You can see the other hand coming around this way. 
So that was, uh, that was a breakthrough, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and then, you know, I kind of did a self-portrait in here, and, you know, some various other things going on. A little frog in here in the logo. Um, I, I did it because I, you know, I, uh, I really liked Andy Warhol. I really liked Bill Reed. This is an Andy Warhol, um, where Andy Warhol has, uh, has actually, you know, done his kind of native art thing. And uh, I actually talked to Martine Reed at the opening, and she told me that uh, Bill Reed and Andy Warhol actually met, and they hung out and went for dinner. And they were talking about, you know, trading some pieces, and I don't think it ever happened, but I thought that was pretty funny, considering I did not know that at all. And here's the Reed piece that it's kind of riffed after. And uh, the idea came when I was talking to my brother one day, actually. Um, you know, it was, uh, we were joking about, you know, wouldn't it be funny if Raven was ripping open a cl uh, can of clam chowder soup and uh, discovering mankind that way? And I did, I, originally I did some drawings where, the, where the, the first people were emerging from the can, and I kind of thought that was taking it a little too far. <laughs> so I scaled that back and uh, just made him kind of punching his claws into the can. So it alludes to it, but it's not quite so obvious. I didn't want to get attacked or anything, you know. Um, and so then that led to uh, another, I, I got into painting, and uh, this is another one of my paintings, just to quickly show you this one. This is, uh, this is called Raven, uh, it's called The Three Watchmen. And uh, this idea kind of came to me, well, oh, actually let me, minimize that a bit. Um, it came to me when Bill Reed's valuable jewelry was stolen from the Museum of Anthropology. And uh, I, it's funny, when that had happened, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great to do an art piece you know, called Repatriation, where I you know, wore a full black suit and like, snuck in and stole a bunch of artwork and then repatriated it, you know, and then was sent to jail. And so I chickened out. <laughs> I chickened out on it, and then it was really stolen, and I was like, holy shit, what a good thing I didn't do that. And uh, it got me thinking, though, about you know, the, the, uh, the watchman and how uh, the, the idea of the watchman has changed over the years, and now uh, most artwork has cameras on it uh, all the time. It's, it's just simply just so valuable, and, and us as human beings, we walk around, we're on camera all the time. You know, you're, you're, in, you're downtown Vancouver, you're on camera. Uh, so these video cameras have become what the watchman was in the past. And so I started playing with that and was thinking like, you know, it's funny, like Bill Reed's sculpture of Raven, who's attracted to shiny things, who's a trickster, is sitting right in front of the jewelry there that was stolen and nobody thought to blame the Raven. And so in this piece, uh, I was kind of like, I also wanted to do a Roy Lichtenstein flash, you know. I just wanted to do it. And so I thought this is a perfect opportunity. And uh, so what I did was I painted it on, on board. So the, the actual flash is wood coming through. Uh, and then on the bracelet is Raven stealing the sun and frog looking, you know, obviously very worried about it. So there's, you know, and then on the lenses are eyes all watching what's going on. So there's a few things going on there. Um, and let me see what else. I got a commission to do a large panel. The requirement was six by eight feet. And I wanted to do something, uh, I kind of always, let me show you this, this painting here. Raft of the Medusa uh, by Jericho. And art history, we studied this so much to death. It was like, I, I saw this in my dreams. And I, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to do an art piece in native art that had kind of this traditional, or, uh, more European structure? You know, the, the triangle, right? You know. Uh, where's the pointer thing here? So, choo, choo, choo. that's the thrust of the action, right? I thought that'd be kind of cool to do. I haven't really seen that. So I came up with this drawing where Raven was holding the sun up, and it's, the piece is called When the Lights Come On. 
And the idea was uh, the world is in darkness before the sun, uh, before Raven stole the sun. And everybody was kind of in chaos. And if you can't see someone, you can't feel compassion for that person, and therefore you fear them. So in the piece, uh, you've got you know, all these guys kind of like biting each other and you know, wrestling with each other. And then Raven raises up the sun, and at that very moment, they're illuminated. And they realize you know, that you know, although we're all different creatures and we're all different you know, races, uh, we're all different you know, from different social and economical backgrounds, we're all just human beings. And so I took this structure, and then I, so this was the drawing I did for it. Uh, and it impressed the client enough for him to commission it. And then that's the piece done in red cedar. Um, with color, obviously, added to it. And you can get a better example of there. Quite a large piece. Um, I didn't realize when I, when I took the commission on that I'd have to, because it's so big, I couldn't carve it uh, on a table. I couldn't reach across it. When you're carving, you have to keep your body really tight, and you have to keep everything in control. And I couldn't do that way out here, so I had to put it on the floor. And I carved for three months, sitting on my ass. So this thing was literally a pain in the ass. Um, and then this client uh, really liked the piece and commissioned another piece for his, his other home. And uh, he wanted a, a much smaller piece. He gave me the dimensions again and said they could not. I like it when people do that. I like when people just give me dimensions and they don't tell me what, try to tell me what to do. You know, it's just like, here's the dimensions and make something. And so I work within that. And so this is the piece. Here's the, the drawing. And this is the one I was telling you about earlier that became both a, both a bracelet and a carving. So this one's called uh, Frog Tag. And I was thinking about, you know, like spray painting. It has the kind of spray paint vibe to it, you know, uh, graffiti. I was thinking about tagging walls. And I was thinking about how uh, it's become like the modern pictograph. And, you know, you, you could tag a wall up to make your claim. And it's like, you know, so much of, so much of native territory now sits in an urban environment where everything's concrete. That's the only way you can really claim it back is to, buy, is to spray bomb a wall, right? Um, so that is the carved piece. I went with the real, like, neon kind of a green for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, was a, this piece was challenging. It was cool. It was like I was playing with levels. Um, instead of just dropping things down and layering, I was starting to do things like, like <laughs> it's really hard to explain. Even to explain it, I was trying to explain it to my dad and my brother how I was going to do it. And they were like, what? You know, and I had to actually show them. But taking things like this, so they slant in and then another one slants out. Um, you might be able to tell a bit more from this one. So you can see, like, in this area here, this is high. And then it slants down, and this actually pops out further than that. Um, again, here, it comes around and from behind and then crosses over. And then this is actually higher than that. Um, so doing a lot of this tipping stuff. It's always got to be, for me, when I make something like my whole thing is I like art that, my, my, my own personal taste is that I like art that catches your eye, it attracts you, it pulls you in, and then it makes you stand in front of it for a period of time. I mean, and so I like that kind of art, and so that's the kind of art that I strive to make. Um, and like I said, I'm my biggest fan. I love my, I love whatever, whatever piece I'm creating is, is the love of my life. And then I finish it, and hold, I love it for about 10 days or so, and then I get rid of it, and I don't want to see it anymore. <laughs> then I visit them, if I'm lucky. Um, let me see what else I have here. How am I doing for time? Uh, three months. OK. Let's see what I got here. Uh, I want to show you guys this. 
painting Dancing Frog. So this painting is uh, five feet by seven feet, done in three colors. Um, I was playing with, this, this I was going back to less conceptual ideas, but going back to uh, design. I felt like I needed to prove something design-wise. I, uh, I always kind of feel like I need to prove something. I'm very competitive with myself, and uh, I felt like I wasn't designing much. Everything was getting very representational and realistic, and so I thought, I want to do design. But I also wanted to do design in a way that I, want, I was looking at box designing, and I was looking at two-dimensional flat design. I was looking at the form line, and I was thinking, how can I make a form line different? And I was thinking, you know, if I, if I use perspective, and I use that perspective edge, I can create a three-dimensional form line, but yet it still remains flat. There's only three colors involved here, which is kind of traditional. Um, so I'm not using shading per se and, and you know, uh, kind of creating a three-dimensional look other than by my use of thinning and thickening a form line, which is what, you know, my ancestors did too. They, they used form line in a rhythmic way to create you know, thin and thick and so that your eye constantly moved over the piece and there was a certain rhythm to it. I wanted to, I took that idea of rhythm and then I created this piece called Dancing Frog, which deals with rhythm, right? Um, and you can see, so this is the frog's head and then one arm loops around here with his hand here and then another arm here, another hand, and then this kind of represents his ass thigh, knee, ankle, foot, again, knee, thigh, and foot. And then within that, there's a bunch of different, um, I guess you call it visual punning. That's what we call it. Is, so within that, there's a bunch of different creatures. I mean, you can see that there's an ovoid in here. These represent kind of ovoids going back into space. You know, there's an ovoid here, and if you flip around, this is a mouth upside down. This here is an eye. This becomes an open mouth, an eye, a nostril, an open or a mouth through here. So it's it's kind of like uh, I don't know. Do some acid or something and look at it. I don't know. Uh, and then I'm just going to show you one more piece. This is kind of a painting I I did fairly recently called uh, Welcome Figure, and I I've, I've been thinking for a, quite a while that. You know, I wanted to do something, something kind of Disneylandish, and I, I couldn't figure out how to do it. I stumbled upon it one day. It's something I've been thinking about for a while. It's usually kind of how my things, they kind of just like stick in your head, and you can't shake them, and you just eventually you work them out. And so I decided upon Mickey, and uh, so there's a few things going on here. Welcome figure, obviously, a uh, welcome figure is erected, you know, outside your community to welcome people into your community. And I was thinking, you know, like, Think about the Vancouver Airport, actually, and how you have welcome figures out there welcoming people to Vancouver. And I was thinking, you know, M Mickey Mouse is kind of a welcome figure to an imaginary land. And those welcome figures out there at the airport are kind of welcome figures to an imaginary land. Um, the, you know, the airport is kind of an interesting place. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, as most airports do, they, they usually fill them up with art from native people from that region. Um, quite often it does not reflect how those native people are treated. You know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of fake. I kind of, I find it kind of fake. Um, although it does help artists and it does help to promote the people. It's kind of a double-edged sword. And so it's kind of one of those gray areas. So of course I was attracted to it. I liked the gray areas. So I thought Mickey Mouse, He's welcoming us to this imaginary land. Uh, and I just did things structurally, like I turned his cheek into a split U, I put a split U in his mouth. I turned everything I could into ovoids, everything I could. These are traditional elements called salmon trout heads. Uh, and then within the body of the mouse, for those people that know about native art and native design, um, I used a really, really old uh, traditional element called the mouse woman. And, and so I took this, this small element that's usually in box designs, and uh, I kind of tweaked it a bit, you know, because Mickey's thrusting. And so I kind of thrusted this mouse woman element out. So there's actually, for those people, 
that know a bit more about native art and art of the Northwest Coast. There's a mouse within a mouse. And I try to do that as much as possible. I try to create many layers in my work so people can catch it visually. I mean, everyone knows this is Mickey Mouse and everyone knows that he's kind of like a Northwest Coast Mickey so they get that, right? But then I want to build things into it because I don't want my work to get stale. I don't want people to buy it and, or you know, have it or see it and kind of get bored with it. I want them to rediscover things throughout the years. Something I started doing in my bracelets was like, you know, I don't want to, that's why I don't usually talk about my work too much is because I want, I want people to look at it and I want people to find things themselves. And people have found stuff that I didn't intend and it makes so much sense. And I'm like, well, you know, that's the way it should be really. You know, as you mature, as you grow as a person, you see more things in my work, hopefully. Uh, as you learn more about the art and learn more about my people, you see thing, you, more things in my work. Um, yeah, I just want it to, want it to last. And so I'll wrap it up there. That's about it. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the people of this land that we are in. Um, I'm from Saskatchewan. I'm Cree, Soto, and Métis. Um, I work mostly in performance art, like Dana said. Uh, and then with performance art, you're always trying to figure out how do you sell it. So you do photographs. Uh, a lot of my work focus, I, I look at myself as a storyteller. Um, grew up with a family of very strong women and so was very influenced um, with their stories and their sense of humor and their dirty talk. Uh, and I also, growing up in Saskatchewan, uh, grew up with a lot of stereotypes of what it was to be an Aboriginal or an Indian woman uh, from Hollywood movies, Disneyland, Pocahontas. Uh, so a lot of my research has been around Indian princesses, uh, whether they're created through the media or their real lives as people, as real Native women who uh, lived at a time and I think were um, I, I see Pocahontas as a pioneer. Um, so growing up with these images and realizing I never really fit into them, realizing I really uh, didn't stand and go like this <laughs> and point. Um, so I wanted to, I, I um, studied theater, theater for a bit and I realized I didn't like theater. Uh, I grew up with a brother who's a visual artist and worked with him as his slave in his studio for a long time. I uh, realized I wasn't a painter. And then he introduced me to performance art. Um, so I'm just, I wanted to, can I open them all up? Uh, they're not going to be in order though. Okay, so I'll just do one at a time. Uh, this is a piece I did in, um, it's kind of dark. In 1996, I was um, asked to do a piece for a show called Native Love and to think about what Native Love meant. Um, is there Native Love? Uh, and then I thought about, I lived in Montreal for nine years and I worked at the Native Women's Shelter and I worked with a lot of women who were single. And they would read Cosmopolitan magazine every month, which I never understood. Because uh, the history of Cosmopolitan magazine, I think to date, there has only been one woman of color on that magazine. So it was very directed to sort of white middle class women. Um, so I wanted to make my own magazine, and I wanted to call it the Cosmo Squaw. I grew up being in a very racist province in the 60s and 70s, and I grew up being called a squaw in a very derogatory way. And my grandmother, when I was 16, was visiting, and I went, um, I went home very upset because I had just been called a uh, fucking ugly squaw. And I told her, she asked me what was wrong, and I told her, and she goes, well, you're not ugly, and you are a squaw. <laughs> so um, so I, uh, from that time forward, I just took on the word, and I called myself a squaw. And so I liked putting Cosmo with squaw together, because it means uh, Native women are one with the cosmos. 
Um, but I also wanted to, um, so this is a Duratrance in a light box. Uh, my performance work, I usually start by doing a photo shoot, and then from the photo shoot I will um, develop a performance. Uh, so my articles, which you can hardly see, is uh, 10 easy makeup tips for a killer bingo face. And then learn, learn how to feed your man, um, what, learn how to spoon feed your man and why he'll come back for seconds. <laughs> so some people get it. Um, <laughs> So that was in 96, and then in 19, two years later, I developed, um, I went around f photographing, I developed the character, the persona. Her name is Betty Daybird, she lived in the 50s, she was a B-movie, a B-movie Hollywood star. Um, this is her in her vision quest in uh, the Arizona desert. Um, so I took her around different parts of North America and just photographed her and different spots. Um, and then the performance ended up being a series of vignettes with, uh, and she likes to drink a lot, so during the performance um, she drinks and has fun. And then she, she went off to be a surfer. <laughs> um, this piece I did in 1997, it's called Lonely Surfer Squaw. And I collect old postcards, and I had an old postcard of the Lonely Surfer. I think it was from the 50s. And I always wanted to be a surfer. And I f thought, well, if I was going to surf on the prairies, how would I do that? And I thought, well, be in a fur bikini and be in the middle of winter and be on the river with a really big board. <laughs> so so um, uh, I sometimes do installation. I had the opportunity to, I don't have an undergraduate degree. I did my master's um, accepted through the prior learning assessment recognition program. And I also apprenticed with James Luna, who is a Native American from California, who's a performance artist. I apprenticed with him for three years. We did four installations and one performance. And this is uh, part of, it's a bad image, but this was part of sort of, we would set up um, photographs and dioramas and it was sort of museum style kind of artifacts of my character, the Cosmos Squaw, and his character, the Shame Man. Um, in the original photograph, I had a fun fur bikini and then somebody had given me a beaver bikini. <laughs> so. Um, and then I found a website, I think it's in northern Saskatchewan, they sell fur bikinis. <laughs> so if you want to get your fur bikinis. Um, I work collaboratively a lot, and in the last four years I've been working with um, Adrian Stimson. He's Blackfoot from Sitsika in Alberta, and he moved to Saskatchewan, and he had asked me if I would work with him uh, on a project, and so he had developed a character called Buffalo Boy, so this is Buffalo Boy right here. And this is Belle Sauvage, and she's the grandmother of Betty Daybird. And she wrote in the only wild, um, gay wild west show in North America, and that's where she met Buffalo Boy. So uh, we ended up doing, setting up, uh, the performance took place uh, I, we did it here at the Western Front the second time. The first time was at the Mendel in Saskatoon. And we, I was always, I always liked at the exhibition in Regina growing up, um, they'd have those dioramas where you could dress up in the old clothes and get your picture taken. So that's what I suggested we did. And so we made our own diorama and we, um, I hired a photographer and we charged people five dollars to they would have to dress up in costumes that we would provide of sort of stereotypical um, different ethnic kind of uh, here's the Métis, Glen Altine. <laughs> this is at the Western Front. So they would have to uh, pay five dollars and then make uh, mark their X because they had to sign all copyright over to us 
And um, um, <laughs> so we wanted the $5 to represent our treaties, which we uh, do, and the X also representing our treaties. Adrian's from Treaty 7, and I'm from Treaty 4. Um, so we, t we just wrapped up the project. We did it uh, Vancouver, Montreal, uh, Kamloops, and then our last one was just in Winnipeg. Uh, we were part of the inaugural opening of Plug-in Gallery there. They just got a new building. But this time we hired, um, or we didn't have, we didn't take the pictures. We asked people to bring their own cameras and take their own pictures. Uh, and we didn't charge them $5, but they still had to give us copyright. Because uh, we'd like to make a book. Um, I'll show you a few more. We got a great one of Rebecca, but I don't have it here. <laughs> uh, it's, I think these were all from the Western Front. And we documented it with um, uh, Polaroid. So it was the 55 we're used to with the negative and the positive, and we'd give them the positive, and we'd keep the negative, but then Polaroid stopped making Polaroid. And so that's sort of what made the project stop, too. Uh, we did it once in digital and had uh, somebody running off the images off of a little printer. So um, we already went there. Yeah, so that was a fun project, and we've gotten the images are blown up uh, um, quite big, and they're and the Polaroid negative makes beautiful black and white photograph because it's four by five. Uh, so I worked with Adrian Simpson, and then Dana commissioned a work f um, from myself for a conference she was doing at SFU uh, in the spring called Unpacking the Indigenous Woman's Body. And she asked myself and Skeena Reese to respond to the film A Man Called Horse, which I've watched way too many times. And I went, the first time I watched it, I realized, well, I need, I need a white man. <laughs> and I have a friend uh, who's a Saskatoon artist. Um, he mo mostly works in film and video. And he just, I thought he would make the perfect white man because I wanted to call my piece Unpacking the White Man. Um, and we sort of, I just took elements from the film and uh, let's see if we can, I could probably open all of these, right? Uh, so we shot a video, we made a short video which the film starts and this is, um, I don't have, I never show video which, is, I guess, being a performance art, art artist is kind of weird because it's action. Um, but I find video doesn't document performance very well, or I'm never happy with it. Um, I'm just going to try open all of these really quick. His, um, all right. Can I control this on here somehow? Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, so we took elements from the film uh, where I was kind of the print, because in the film there's a princess and then there's kind of a, a wicked squaw woman. So I was kind of both characters. And um, I beat him, <laughs> dragged him. I kind of took him ca captive. And then I just show him different elements. Uh, in my performance, crushing berries seems to be a big element. Um, so I taught my white man how to crush berries. Um, <laughs> he had a hard time learning, though. <laughs> and then um, I taught him how to gut a fish, which I don't even know how to do. But <laughs> uh, and then we kind of fall in love. Oh, and he's had to start fire for me. <laughs> and then, in the end, I give him his ShamWow loincloth, <laughs> and we dance. I, I have him buy a rope that was really long. <laughs> and so that was just my response to the film. Um, 
Has anybody seen the film, A Man Called Horse? Don't watch it. <laughs> or should they, Dada? <laughs> so in the end, I get my white man and I take him off. Uh, um, images. In 1996 or 2006 I was curated at the Mendel for a solo show by Dan Ring. Um, at the time uh, I had been, um, a lot of my performances are based on stories whether they're my own stories or my mother's stories and I always ask permission to use them and talk uh, with my mother. Uh, th my piece at the Mendel was an uh, installation of photographs, and I did a performance for the night of the opening, um, which I cut off my hair. Uh, I used to have long hair, but I don't seem to have too many images of it. So I photographed seven people, including myself, in this. I was really interested in this action. of, um, And the piece is really about uh, death and life and how time is sort of doesn't exist within those two elements. Um, and I recorded an audio piece that told four stories of birth and two stories of death and one story of almost death as I braided my hair and cut it off. Um, um, so that was that piece. And I was interested in the word grace and sort of the duality of that word and how, you know, it can mean you can walk in grace or fall from grace or... Um, grace could be a name. So again, I'm, I'm interested in sort of the image of the Native woman, especially I think for uh, Native women on the plains, we have been stereotyped to death. Um, I collect Indian dolls, and I decided I had an Indian doll, and I decided I wanted to become her. So I, she's from like the 50s, I think, and it was made by, um, a family in Burlington, Ontario, and I was asked to, um, but I did a performance in Toronto. There was the Performance Studies International Conference, and they wanted it to be outside, and so I, I call this piece Feast or Famine, and uh, let's see if I can find an image of the doll, her with the doll. Um, it was very hot. It was a really hot June day, and I stacked wood. And back here, I had uh, two women cooking buffalo burgers, which I wanted to feed to the audience. But then the conference people got really upset, and they said, "Well, no, you can't. You can feed the conference people, but you can't feed the public." And I just thought, "I'm not going to. I'm going to feed whoever I want." So then I decided I was going to make all these burgers and not feed anybody. And send them to a shelter. Um, but then the conference organizers decided that um, I could feed people. <laughs> and the performance took place, I think it was about two, two hours, maybe an hour and a half, and I just stacked wood. And I ate a McDonald's hamburger while they ate organic buffalo meat. <laughs> um, So that was uh, that piece. I don't know if I'll do it again. It was really, really hot. And I actually would like to try find the family who made the original doll. I think they're called the Deerfoot family. But then is it a made-up name? Because there was a little tag on her leg, which I also created for the piece. Because um, in the end, I... Uh, I took off the outfit and just laid it across. Uh, try to find a picture of the tag. I don't know though. Um, 
So, I work in different formats. I've done printmaking. Um, I do a lot of my research by watching TV. Um, and I was in Banff, and they had asked if I would do a print series. So I had taken my Belle Sauvage. And I originally shot her in um, infrared film, which I thought was really interesting, because when I looked at it, I looked like a white woman, I thought, because my eyes looked green, because infrared picks up all the heat. And, and then I hand tinted the original photograph. Um, but I thought she would make a nice print, so that that's um, and this is Belle Sauvage too. She glows. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so with a lot of my work, um, the process of making it is takes me a couple years to sometimes long time, like six years to put a performance together. Um, the Grace piece now has gone from being this whole exhibition to just being a performance, uh, which I probably won't do again because I don't have long hair. Um, but I did, I went, I took it to Venice for the 2005 Venice Biennale. I was part of a project with Shelley Nero and it was curated by Ryan Rice and Nancy Mitlow. Uh, and we worked with the University of Venice and um, the, I, I found it was interesting that the Italians, they got it, even though it was the stories that were told in English. Um, but they, we had candles made, sort of prayer candles that I surrounded myself with, and, um, and then just the audio played as I just did the two actions. And I didn't cut off my hair because I didn't have any. Um, how am I doing for time, Dana? Okay. Of the grace, is there is there internet? No. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's I'm inspired by people like Rebecca Belmore, uh, James Luna, my brother Edward Petra, uh, Dana Claxton has been huge influence too. Um, I think being a performance artist is. Uh, being native and being a performance artist is a way of being able to make a piece that doesn't... Um, you can say things in performance art that you can't say in painting or you can't say in other mediums. So, uh, and it's fun. So I like to have fun. <laughs> so that's it. So hello again, my name is Dana Claxton, and um, I have been making art for about 20 years, and also like Lori, work in performance and photography and filmmaking uh, and installation. And um, I thought I'd just show you a, a video clip of a work called Buffalo Bone China, and I'll talk over it while it's running. So the idea of Buffalo Bone China was to uh, smash a whole set of Royal Albert Buffalo Bone China dishes. And during the extermination period of the buffalo, uh, you know, which was an incredible waste, um, as well as uh, you know, spiritually harmed the plains people, and was of great concern to my own ancestors because you know they were starving while the buffalo were being exterminated. And it was this decision that both the American and Canadian governments had made to exterminate for many reasons, for you know, Western expansion, for the building of the railroad, but also to starve Plains people. And um, the buffalo bone industry became a huge big business. And the finer bones of the shanks, the buffalo shanks and their legs, would be uh, sent to England to make fine bone china. And so, you know, while well, my own ancestors and Lori's as well uh, were starving because of this, um, 
then it's you know it's a story that we hear over and over in, 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 in terms of my my family's lore. Uh, I'll run it again. So I wanted to. Oh, so they would send the, the, the they'd send those pieces to to England to make fine bone china, and of course nowadays you know bone china is made from domesticated goat and uh, cow, but at some point there was also ones made from buffalo. So um, it was fantastic to do this, and uh, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into because it was a violent act and it took a long time. And the, uh, it was actually, Lori had curated this. This is going to sound very nepotistic, but you know, we're all artists and we all work in the same community. <laughs> but so she had curated it in, in uh, Saskatchewan. And you know, it was important as well as this, play, this work had to take place in Saskatchewan. And it, initially I thought about doing it outdoors in you know, 60, 50 below weather, but it didn't seem practical. And so we did it indoors. So when we were testing it that afternoon at the gallery, we realized that we had to put in some kind of protection for the audience because when you smash this stuff, it just charts out and it, you know, becomes like little daggers. And uh, so then I, you know, realized I had to wear protective gear as well, and it was kind of scary. And uh, so I did it for about uh, 45 minutes to this fairly uh, somber music, and um, the the afternoon of that performance. I had given a talk at the uh, uh, university, and the students knew what I was going to do. So that evening, they brought uh, some of the students brought in pieces of china that they wanted me to smash. And one girl snuck some out, and her parents didn't know. So I, I said, "No, I, you've got to tell your parents about this." And then another woman brought in uh, Japanese porcelain and so that wouldn't work because it had to be British. It had to be British. And so it was interesting during the uh, event too is that uh, a reporter from CBC Radio uh, um, interviewed me and I guess CBC Radio had gotten calls saying what a waste of public money this was that an artist would be smashing a complete set of fine bone china because also growing up in Saskatchewan it was this complete status symbol if you had a set of Royal Albert dishes and our dishes were from Esso from the gas station, <laughs> so so we never had, we never had them, but uh, uh, so it became the big joke with everybody that you know watch your fine bone china around Dana, and um, and so it was a performance that uh, then turned into what am I trying to do here? Uh, that turned into um, an installation. Let me just show you here. And there was a video component. I'll just show you some of these. So this is when it became a uh, installation. And so the bones were put into uh, the center of these stanchions, which represented the four directions and the four gates of the uh, Sundance. And there's the uh, dishes broken. And then that was sort of more of a formal installation. And then the video projection plays of this massacre of the buffalo, but then the buffalo through uh, uh, Indian power, Indian manna come back and, and then the buffalo are back. And so um, he screams at the table because he has you know, this lovely set of china, but he has nothing to eat. So it's sort of one of those classic uh, silent screams. Um, so uh, what I'm also interested in is, is looking at history um, and uh, my own uh, Lakota cosmology and bringing in iconography into, you know, into my own art practice. Um, oh, no, I don't want to go back there. I just wanted to show you some of the photos I did, sort of did out of order. So anyway, so after I smashed the dishes, and, and what had happened was it became, it was on a dining table. I'm just going to take my jacket off. It was on a dining table, and it, how we ended, I still had a few more dishes to smash, but the table just ended up collapsing. 
And so I thought that was really apropos. And uh, so then I had a change of clothes and uh, sort of put on this faux buffalo outfit. And um, I'm still uh, uh, working through ideas of crossing the taboo and, you know, in the spiritual taboo and when, you know, how far we can cross these lines of these uh, sort of sacred things that aren't meant for the art gallery. But, you know, over the last few years, I've th th been thinking that all of these things are made for the art gallery. Uh, and they always have been part of our everyday life and everyday living. And it's because of this collision that we've had with, you know, with, the, with, with contact and, and, and colonialism that some of those things that were everyday have, uh, you know, we've, we've, uh, uh, um, we've uh, kept them so precious to protect them. And so for the last few years, what I'm interested in doing is, is still, of course, protecting them, but also bringing them into everything that I do with everything that I do in my life. So I had a uh, change of clothes. And in this photograph, I'm wearing these little aqua booties because I thought my, my moccasins that my auntie had made me were far too sacred to wear when I was making art. <laughs> so it was this really dilemma that, you know, this dilemma that I was having that I, I couldn't do that and, uh, or even wear a real buffalo. But I've uh, changed, a bit, changed it up a bit since then. And so I'm unwrapping the um, four bundles of the uh, fine bone china and then uh, bringing them into this space. And the idea was about sort of sanctifying that area. And then here I am, uh, it's a bit out of order, smashing the, uh, the fine bone china, and there's the um, scene of the crime. Um, let's just see, close this. Uh, so Lori and I actually both come from Saskatchewan, and uh, my own family history is um, my great great grandparents came to Canada with Sitting Bull, and you know escaping that difficult history that's in America, and you know so I, I uh, and many of my descendants were uh, with the uh, at the uh, Battle of Little Bighorn. And a lot of people don't know, but in Saskatchewan, well, in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, there's 14 uh, Sioux re communities, Sioux reserves, both Lakota and Dakota, and a Nakota one. So there is a Sioux existence in Canada, but a lot of people don't know. And uh, also within Saskatchewan, and, or within Moose Jaw, where I grew up. And so as a child growing up, you know, there was only one or two, you know, brown families. And... Um, and so I always wanted to do something to recognize, you know, Sioux history within Canada and uh, within Saskatchewan and then further within Moose Jaw. So this was a work called Sitting Bull in the Moose Jaw Sioux, and it's a four-channel video installation that um, looked at that history but also brought that story into contemporary life. And this particular scene here, I think I'll use this little gadget, Oh, it's not as big on here. The side. Forward. Oh. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> so the I'll just say is that so the, the three panels on this wall are um, three different channels. And it's snowing out in Moose Jaw when I went to, to, to do some research. And um, I wanted to find remnants, contemporary remnants of Sioux history. And it was so great because there was signage. There was Sioux Crescent. So I, uh, that, these streets are called Sioux Crescent. And it was a commission from the Moose Jaw Art Gallery and Museum. And what is it? Thank you so much. And the thing about the museum, there it says Sioux Crescent there is that um, they have a, a very significant collection of Sioux artifacts. And if anybody is doing research on the Sioux in Canada, you have to come to Moose Jaw. And you have to go to this lovely little museum. 
And um, as a result, it was rich with resource material for me to look at who else has been doing research. There was a lot of uh, American and international scholars who were studying Sitting Bull. You know, I mean, you know, he's sexy, right? Sitting Bull is sexy. And so I always thought that, I thought, why doesn't Moose Jaw celebrate him? But of course, that would have to unearth this whole sort of political conversation because here we have, is it this one? Ah. I have better, for, better images, but this is the fourth channel, and it's of the actual Sioux camp that still exists, uh, that's still there. It was, it was lovely walking through it because there were still sort of little shreds of artifact and beads and the different things that we were finding. And what happened was uh, because the Sitting Bull camp was just situated on the outskirts of town is that it, uh, that, um, that was their, their, their winter camp. So they camped there in the winter, and then in the summer they would go to Cypress Hills. And uh, so a, a local minister had given um, the city this large plot of land to say, to, he said, I'll give you this uh, for the Sioux camp, and in trade you have to build a school for the Sioux children. And um, so that land, in, in perpetuity, he gave the land. So the land is still there in perpetuity for the Sioux people. And so while I was doing this project, the mayor and the council invited me to a meeting to ask, you know, what do I think they should be doing with this, this beautiful space that's still there? Because uh, people want to build con con uh, a condominium site and a golf course and that kind of thing, of course. And other people want to leave it natural. So part of the three-channel installation, you can imagine this is all moving, there's dialogue, there's audio, there's sound, and then here we have, I can't get this thing to work, which one is, anyways, in the center panel, we have Johnny LeCain, who was this, this really dynamic storyteller, and he would go back to Wood Mountain, he grew up in Wood Mountain, and uh, would, of course, I always go back there as an adult, but when he was growing up as a child, he always hung out with the old timers and some of the old timers who, uh, uh, who had direct stories of the Battle of uh, Little Bighorn and war stories. He was a war story expert. And so he told the, the most amazing stories as if he had been there. And the stories that he told of, of, of the, uh, of the um, takedown of Custer were so beautifully told in the detail and the sound and the images and the sparkles of his saber. I mean, the way he talks, because he listened to what the old timers were telling him. And he talked about that when he would go. And first of all, of course, they would cut the tobacco and then they'd smoke the chinupa and then they would talk. So the way he could tell a story was quite amazing. And so this is Sitting Bull on one side. John LeCain, who's also a descendant of the people uh, uh, and, uh, from the uh, United States. And then you can't really see it, but that's a ledger drawing, those famous ledger drawings. And this Sitting Bull did his own ledger drawings, and primarily they were of uh, war stories. Um, and so this is a, another element of Johnny speaking, and again, for me, bringing in the colors of the Sundance, the six colors of the Sundance, and then it's snowing in the background. Um, because of the archives at the Mushon Museum and the uh, library, there was many news articles. <coughs> Pardon me. Talking about uh, this history of the Sioux in <coughs> Mushra. I just wanted to show you this image because it gives you perspective of how large the piece is. There's uh, Heather Smith. So Moose Jaw has one of the longest walls in Canada for exhibition. It's 72 feet long. So if you ever want to do a long panel, Sean, you know where you can, who can house it. And it's this beautiful long wall. And so after this experience with the Moose Jaw Art Gallery, I had realized that I really want to uh, be in a conversation with smaller public art institutions that I'm not just interested in large institutions that are, quote, the center. Uh, you know, I realize my conversations that are intimate uh, with Canadians looking at our shared history and our difficult history are everywhere in Canada. So I'd like to show everywhere. So that was Sitting Bow in the Moose Jaw Sioux. And if you wanted to see any of the video, it's at, uh, on, on that site down at claxton.com. Um, 
It's interesting uh, just hearing Lori say that she went to theater school and, and I did as well here in Vancouver to Spirit Song Native Indian Theater School in the 80s. And it was like this clearinghouse for uh, urban Indians who came to town who were creative and, you know, and, and didn't really know what our options were, that even art college could be an option. We just knew we were creative and we could congregate in this place and share all of our shared trauma together. And um, so, you know, we were doing all these legends, and I remember I had to be a, a raccoon. I was a speaking raccoon at Expo, and then I was a flying canoe princess. And there were all these lovely legends that, of course, had lessons attached to them, and they were pedagogical, but at the same time, they just weren't quite enough, you know, for, for what I wanted to say. And so I started uh, writing my own um, uh, plays and then turned the plays into uh, films. And so my early practice, which I am returning to, is, has been shooting in 35 millimeter sync sound dramatic films that are uh, non-linear uh, experimental cinema, basically, you, and with an all Aboriginal cast. And you, know, you work with who you, who you know. Um, so the theatrical and the performative have, uh, you know, basically been haunting my work for a long time. And so in these, this series of photographs called The Mustang Suite, it was a uh, work that was a commission for the uh, Cultural Olympiad. And um, so the inspiration point was thinking about Black Elk's vision of the horse dance, and uh, which the horse, dan ha the horse dance is still... Uh, performed on the plains, and um, so that was the starting point, just thinking of this lovely vision of the horse dance and what it entails and how they dance and the directions that they dance in and all of the colors involved and, um, and the songs that go with it. And so in, oops, pardon me, so in this particular work, everybody had to have a horse. And so this is Mama Has a Pony, girl named History and Sets Her Free. So Mama, of course, is She's wearing a, sort of this faux, a combination of uh, a Sundance dress as well as I work with a Salish, a local Salish designer who used a lot of wool and, and, uh, and she's setting history free. So she's saying to history, I'm no longer gonna be burdened by you. I don't want anything to do with you. And I'm talking about the ugly, you know, the ugly history and just go now, you're free history. And so history is trotting off sort of slightly uh, humiliated because she's, you know, sort of a, um, has been a slave to that history as well. And um, so her dance feather is, you know, making reference to the whole burlesque culture and, you know, women being empowered through their sexuality, um, but as well as a traditional uh, powwow dancer made the fan for me. So it was quite ironic when I, you know, when I said to him, you know, will you make me this dance fan? And he was like, well, how big do you want it? Like, you know, and he was telling me, I'm going to use ostrich feathers, it's going to be huge, because he's used to working with, of course, smaller feathers. And so it's a very traditional dance fan, but that ended up, you know, I ended up actually giving it to a girl that does sort of a burlesque show, because it uh, covered her whole body. So it was quite interesting the way that worked. Um, so history trots off humiliated. And so Daddy's got a new ride. Of course, his pony is the, uh, the Mustang car. And um, he is in a duality of two worlds. He's not disempowered. He's not disembodied. He's not disenfranchised. He's empowered that he exists uh, as an Indian tribal man uh, and, ha and, you know, and has these modern contemporary things. Um, so he you know, goes to work, and he can wear his... Uh, you know, his battle paint, his war paint, or his ceremonial paint. So it's making all of those references. And often my work has, you know, three or four entry points and meanings. Uh, baby boy's got an Indian horse. Again, he's not disenfranchised or disempowered. And he is it's replicating that, yeah, I'm, I'm a young fellow here. I'm, you know, wearing my Adidas track pants, and I'm still riding my pony, and I'm looking right at you. And so all of these images are looking right at the viewer, and of course, generally, in the context of art galleries, you know, the viewership is non-Indian, and um, so he's, it's it's about Indian subjectivity and looking at you, saying, you know, it's not it's not saying who am I, 
It's looking at the non-Indian saying, who are you in relationship to me? Baby girl's got a Mustang. <laughs> so again, these young girls are um, wearing red. I work a lot with the color red, the sacred color red, as well as red power, red resistance, and um, the red nations. And so they have, quote, the traditional mukluks from Army and Navy. And, um, and then their red ponies that they have. And again, they're staring right at the viewer. And family portrait, Indians on a blanket. And again, as we've seen with Laurie's work, and that often a lot of artists are looking at that, you know, sort of the, the cliche archival image of Aboriginal people. And um, so, you know, they're lovely, usually sitting on the blanket, all these sort of Edgar Curtis uh, surface works. And so I wanted to put them on the blanket, but sitting on the chair, because I remember one of my students said, Emily Carr, when I taught there, asked me so innocently and sincerely, he said, did we kind of win because we had chairs and tables? And I thought that was such a fascinating idea, and, you know, and that he was so sincere. And so that's why I plunked the chair down. And, uh, and he sat on it, not as the great uh, patriarch of the family, but he's surrounded by love and that they're a family, that they're an Indian family. You know, if we think about the, uh, of course, the horrific uh, 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 fallout of residential schools and the breakups of family, and just, you know, there's the, there, that's uh, still harming gen generations of our families. Um, so this is the Mustang suite that's been, uh, was installed at the National Gallery, so you can get a sense of what they are like together. This is paint up, and I won't talk much longer. This is a, um, a fellow, Joe Joseph, who I've worked with and I've known since he was six years old, and he's 30 now, and continue to work with him in my work. And, um, and so I asked him if he would paint up for me, and he's both a traditional dancer and uh, for powwow and a longhouse dancer. And so the mixture of painting his face from, with powwow and longhouse dancing to create what he has, is, it's just insane. If you, you know, I mean, it, it's, it, 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 as you can see, Sean, the, you know, the, very, the, 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 uh, the design around his eyes is very specific to Salish iconography. And um, he's used uh, uh, smokehouse paint, the red, the ceremonial paint. And it was uh, a very generous act for him to paint up for me. And so these are six by six feet, and um, so they're majestic. And they're sort of my my joke is that they're also they're called paint up number one, but they're also Indian in your face. And uh, I'm supposed to laugh at that part. <laughs> and so again, he's looking at the viewer, saying, you know, who are you? What have you done? What are you doing? And he's empowered. These aren't disempowered images. And there's Joseph at the opening taking a picture of, uh, of his picture. Um, uh, because of my filmmaking background and video making background, I, I, when I work in photography, I always want to make you know five or six or seven or eight or 10 images. And so this was the Buffalo Girls. And there's three of them, but there's actually five in the series. And that's how they go when they're hung. And on the one side is a buffalo robe, and then they hold these little stuffed buffalo and eagle, and then there's an the eagle fan on the end. And the idea was that these things exist in different ways, but they also still exist. So the one image is of a close-up of a buffalo robe, and then the young girls holding them, who I've worked with these girls a lot as well. I seem to work with the same people over and over. And then they go into another zone, and then they transform, and then they are part of both of these nations, both the Buffalo Nation and the Eagle Nation. Um, this is a, a work that, you know, it, is, it was from about 1997 called Jingle Dress, and it was from a film I shot, and I've just actually uh, decided to release some of them as, as uh, individual pieces. And so, of course, you know, here she is with, you know, the Jingle Dress surrounded by this technology 
but that as you know, indigenous people were surrounded by these technologies that we've adapted and also survived. So I seem to make a lot of those considerations about survival and about resistance. And um, these are <laughs> works from when I was in Paris a few years ago and I thought I'm gonna walk around Paris, I do wherever city I go and see what I can find that's Indian. And so it was fabulous stuff. Paris had all kinds of, so did Barcelona. Indian stuff everywhere. So this was an Indian shop that sold headdresses and chokers. And, and then there's this Ulysses Cowboy and Indian book. And this, so there were two different windows. There was all shop windows. So these are actually two separate windows. And then this one, I was walking over one of those lovely bridges. So remember, this is two images. But this one of the Zapatista, I thought it was so fabulous, that this ripped up poster from a Zapatista documentary, and then in the background was a Notre Dame. So of course, you know, just making those, that, that, uh, those difficult histories, and just seeing that there, and then, you know, and, and then coupled with the Dalai Lama, <coughs> who, pardon me, you know, of course, making the, uh, relationship of liberation movements. Talking about liberation, this is some of my newest work that I'm in love with, Sean. So when you said you were in love with your work, I didn't feel so bad, because I do, you love a work for a while, and then you go on to the next one. <laughs> and so I, I'm loving this work right now, and it's called AIM, um, AIM 1, AIM 2, AIM 3, and 4, for the American Indian Movement. And when I was living in New York, um, in the late 80s and early 90s, it was lovely to go to the New York Museum and do research about Lakota people. And it was interesting to see how much uh, of, Lakota, of Lakota history was within the war section, you know, because of all the big Indian wars and da da da, da without getting too much into it. Um, but what I did locate was these beautiful declassified FBI documents. And so I've been lugging them around for the last 20 years, I always think, and think I'm going to do something with these. And I did once in a, in a performance about 20 years ago. I made copies and gave everybody one each. But this, what I did with these was I just shot them with a 35 mil uh, analog camera, film camera. And then in the lab, although I didn't do the work in the lab myself, but they were hand pulled. Uh, negatives to be uh, three and a half by five feet of these declassified documents. And so the one with the big black, I mean, I think aesthetically, they're so beautiful just to look at, you know, just this blackness and just the form of it. And, um, but, you know, they're declassified and everything's sort of hidden of what might have been in these documents. And then on the, the other one, on the other side, lists all the uh, uh, fellows who were considered the founders of the American Indian movement. So here's a close-up shot of the one, and it just says this document contains neither recommendations nor conclusions of the FBI. It is the property of the FBI and is loaned to your agency, and it, it contains, and it, I can't read it, sorry. Anyways, they're all declassified, so. Um, and, but at once where they were confidential and threatening, they you know, become declassified. And I just thought they were beautiful aesthetically, but also I wanted to beautify that moment of the American Indian movement. And because you know, they, they were a bona fide liberation movement that uh, had the best of intentions, and I wanted to revisit that. Oops, and I wanted to revisit that. Um, I think that's all I have to say. <laughs> it's my last line. <laughs> Thank you.